So I wanna thank each of our panelists for being here. And I also just wanna to say to those of you who are watching this, whether you live in Cambridge or anywhere in the state um, who have been impacted by COVID-19 in some capacity, if you're grieving the loss of a loved one, a neighbor, a community member, or you're just grieving the loss of the life that you knew it and the security that your life once afforded you, or you're wondering um, how to build security when that was already very challenging before this pandemic hit us. Um, I wanna say that we are working, I'm working really hard to make sure that your concerns and, and your needs to, um, to help navigate this are, are being addressed. And I encourage you to please feel free to reach out to me anytime. For my panelists who are here with me today, I wanna say thank you so much for the work that you're doing prior to this pandemic. Um, some of you have worked with me prior to being a state representative. You know that early childhood education has been really an area, even before I had children, where I very clearly understood the importance. Really the work that you do, the education and the care that you make sure that our youngest, our youngest residents of our neighborhoods and our families get can make a significant difference about where, where their life will take them. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Head Start, and I know that you know having a really strong, affordable early childhood education um, really enabled my mom to work to, and to have the confidence to know that I was safe and that I was learning. We're now faced at a time in which children have had their education and the safety of their schools and their um, early education centers and their child care programs and their providers and, and those who loved them and knew them in addition to their family have been quickly just taken away from them. And so there's a lot of issues here. There's the impact of how that impacts children's safety, how it impacts their, their mental health, their well-being, and uh, as well as how that impacts the rest of the family. So I will just quickly say that we are moving into what seems to be phase two of the reopening of our state. Um, we have been learning as we go along from the governor what that means. I will be clear that in my conversation with the lieutenant governor, who was the advisor of this opening up um, committee, I had a conversation with her very late on a Friday night, and I said, how can you have an advisory committee that doesn't have anybody from childcare to construction? Um, how do you have an advisory committee that does not have the actual stakeholders at the table with you? Um, and so to be clear, we, we just agreed to disagree on how important that would be. I will tell you, many people continue to believe that we have failed in providing really clear, safe guidelines. I don't think you can open up an economy um, until we have first dealt with primarily how do children and families safely access care in a pandemic with an infectious disease. So with that said, um, I know that all of you have a lot to say about this and I, I look forward to the conversation at hand. Um, I'll, I'll introduce who's on the panel and then I'll allow each of you to maybe just introduce yourselves a little bit. So I have Amy O'Leary. Amy, if you want to hire, um, wave. Um, Amy has years and years of experience in advocacy around and is the director of early education for all. Bill Eddy, also somebody who's been in the field advocating and really working to support providers um, who are trying to support the needs of children as the executive director of the Massachusetts Association for Early Education and Care. Leanne Ellis, who is the early childhood director for the birth through, uh, through third grade efforts in Cambridge, has been a, a lightning rod and a, and a force to be reckoned with um, for, for over a decade, maybe two. I, I'm losing track, Leanne. Um, but I also know that you've been playing in a really um, critical role at this time in supporting providers and families. And Khadija Berry, a family child care owner who um, I have not met directly, but I tell you when I put it out there that you were on, I got a lot of emails and love of people who clearly know you. And the work that you do as a family child care provider was um, an area that I had actually focused on prior to leaving um, and, and leaving council to going into the legislature, understanding that incredibly important role that our family um, providers play and who I think also face inequitable resources um, as providers. So I wanna say thank you to each of you for being here. And um, already my, my chat room is filling up with questions. Um, I'm gonna ask, and I, I'll start with, um, I'll start with you, Khadija, because you're the only one on the panel that actually has to um, face the reality of whether or not the guidelines that were put out, are they sufficient? Um, do you believe that um, they'll actually allow you to care for children, keep them safe? Will we have enough opportunities for families and, um, 
do you believe that your concerns are actually being um, that are being represented and what's being offered and and what are your hopes and what are your fears? It's a lot, I know, um, but I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts and more importantly, the work you've been doing. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. The guidelines alone, it's I did not um, expect it to be like that. It's very challenging for many, many reasons. And I am just, I'm going to take one day at a time and having Leanne and uh, birth the third uh, team behind me and my other colleagues, I think we, um, we're so lucky. And I'm just looking to go back to work. And it's a lot, a lot of information. So I don't know if that answered the question. I think we'll have a lot more questions for you, but I think it's a good place to start, right? So it just feels like it's a lot to take on right now and one day at a time. Um, so I will ask, um, I'll ask you, Bill, um, since you work also directly with many of the providers and, and individuals who are being expected to, to be able to meet these standards, have we done enough? Have we fallen short and where else do we need to go? Well, it's certainly comprehensive. I don't think anyone's going to doubt that. Uh, whether it's comprehensive, good or bad, is, is, is up for discussion. But, you know, clearly it's, it's, a, it's a new, yeah, I hate the phrase, it, it's a new normal, uh, the most overused phrase we have in, uh, uh, today. Um, it's, it certainly puts providers in a difficult spot. Um, the reduced ratios, um, you know, the, the obviously, the limiting of how many children will be in care, uh, it has a financial impact on providers. Um, the health and safety regs are rigorous uh, and will be a extremely burdensome on early education programs and early family child care early educators. Um, if you transport, oh my gosh, uh, that's a whole new uh, experience now too. Um, but the one thing I did talk to the commissioner about this morning is Keeping in mind what early education is at, at its heart, it's about the educational and the meeting the developmental needs of children. And one aspect of that is bringing out the joy in children. I mean, if you look at these these regs, they're grim. They're very grim. No water tables, no field trips. All this, all the the joy that's in early education with children each day. I mean, you read this document. You're not going to leave with a smile here. It's it's a pretty grim document, and so we've said to the commissioner that we're hoping that there could be some flexibility, some common sense that's put in these. You know that you know keeps in mind there are CDC you know guidelines out there for children, and this may go a little bit beyond that. But that said, this commissioner is in a tough spot. Uh, she's trying to satisfy two things: health and safety yet the need for economic reopening in this Commonwealth. And like every other state, that's a tough balancing act. So bottom line for us, providers will meet the need. I mean, providers will step up, they'll meet what needs to be met in these guidelines. Uh, I have no doubt, this is a field that, and Khadija is a perfect example. Folks wanna go back to work. They want to help families. They want to help children, you know, have high quality early education that we have in the state. And so they'll meet what it has to be met, but it's it's definitely right now going to be a bit different. Yeah. I'm going to go to Leanne, and I'm going to save Amy since she's played a, also a role statewide here. Leanne, I, is is this is it workable? Are, are are we going to have children in Cambridge who can actually access care and can providers um, can can they sustain themselves? Well, that's a really good question, Marjorie, I, and thank you for having me. I think Bill is really great. Uh, when you read the, the regulations and there's no sensory, a lot of sensory items have been taken out and um, no sharing, which we try to teach children in early childhood. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to have to really be creative to work around. So, for example, can we put shaving cream on trays that children work on, you know, and you can't have a sand table? Can you have a tray of sand? Can you have a tray of dirt? Can you do things like that? And I think Bill is right. This is a creative field. We're going to have to figure it out. And and provide children with the joy and the exploration that they really need to feel good about themselves and to learn and to develop. I think there are a lot of issues around this. The second bathroom is a real crisis for family childcare. 
you know, nobody has a second bathroom to put the, for the child to go to. I think the other thing is if you can't, if a, you're a family childcare and you don't have a backyard, for example, where's, and you can't go to public playgrounds, that's also going to be tight. So, you know, we're trying to figure out with our health department, you know, what are the strategies and tips that we could maybe use um, around parachutes in classrooms, around uh, ring toss, you know, can we have little in the driveway, can we have little cones and scoot around them running and keep children back? It, it's going to be really tricky. And I really worry that people are not going to be able to meet these regulations, which I think are good, a little tighter than the CDC even, and good for not propagating the COVID. But are we going to be able to meet them by July 15th? I mean, nobody's going to open June 8th. Because by the time you get your plans together, your staffing pattern, where are you gonna put the sick child? It's gonna to be tough. And the worry, and I'll stop. The worry for me is half the revenue and more cost and the loss of the workforce. And, and it really affects women of color, not only in family child, they're minority women who own their business. But if you look at our field, generally women and generally women of color. So, Liam, could you also just interest, you know, I'm going to come back to Bill in a second um, and Khadija in the next round, but could you just introduce your role as well and your title? Oh, I know who you all are, but I'm realizing yeah. that not everybody actually knows what you yeah. do. I'm the early childhood director for the city of Cambridge and I work between, I, I sit between Cambridge Public Schools and the city. And, you know, one of the things that we've done is we've done a lot of work around supporting family child care and uh, center based care. Um, increasing scholarships until we can get to a UPK and looking at the health and well-being of young children. Thank you, Leanne. And I'll come back to Bill and Khadija. Um, but um, Amy, you have a, a really close front up, uh, up front look mm -hmm. at what we're doing at the state level. And we have still a relatively brand new commissioner of early education and care. Um, you know, what a way to come in. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my heart definitely feels for her. And I, I guess what I would ask you, you know, are, are we going too quickly? And whose needs are we trying to meet here? Is it children? Is it workers? And which workers? Because the essential workers have been going a long time at this, right? And I know we've done our best to create essential care for children, but even that had a lot of flaws, right? Because child care is not just about having slots available in, throughout the state. It's about ensuring that the whole child's community of providers and carers and the parents, like it's a community, right? So hard to do that when we were seeing it as a crisis response for essential care workers, but are we really ready to do this? And, and who, who, whose needs are we trying to meet? Are we going too quickly or is it just, we need to get started? Well, first, thanks for having us here and for covering. We know this is an important issue for you and you've been a leader in the house um, and in your other lives as well. And I think um, as we, so Strategies for Children as a policy and advocacy organization, we are also connected to our partner organizations across all 50 states. And the decision to close childcare was one that most states did not make. So we do have an opportunity to think about what it looks like moving forward. What we've learned from other states is even programs who have not closed, they're running uh, very low in their utilization rate. So even states who have been open um, for a month or so, they're running about 50% of a utilization rate. So on top of the challenges that we're hearing about, you know, what some of the new requirements will require, we also really need to be paying attention to parents' wants and needs. And, you know, who are we doing this for is important. Childcare has always been you know, a balance between supporting parents who need to go to work and the developmental needs of young children. We also know that uh, public schools were closed and, you know, we don't ask about a seven-year-old whose mom is a nurse or, or, or a doctor about what's happening to that child. So we also know that families don't live in funding streams necessarily. And right now we're watching families think about, you know, all of their child developmental needs. 
I think it's if we're moving to I think the department was uh, has a process to put the guidelines out the requirements and then have a feedback loop. I think right now many people like Khadija said are a little bit in shock and trying to review and imagine what the world would look like. I think what we know is we have a complex system to start with pre COVID it was fragile. During COVID, we're just exasperating some of the inequities that we have seen in our system. And I think the finances, we are going to have to reckon with this. Um, we, we, were, we didn't have enough funding uh, before to now have lower ratios, which is really based on the health and, of, of children. And I think I also envy and don't envy the people who have to make decisions about what a policy would look like, thinking about the severity of the health crisis that we've seen so far. So I think we do need to learn from the emergency providers. We need to understand real-time supply and demand. We heard a few weeks ago as families were hearing from their own employers about what it might look like to open up. Some were being told to continue work from home until September. That's gonna have an impact on their childcare needs. Some have been going to work all the time and have figured out other arrangements, which may or may not last. And I think to your original point of how are we best supporting children's developmental milestones? As we move from the emergency, we are gonna have to think about these questions. And we know that no matter what, programs are gonna need flexible, stable funding if they have a chance of making it in this new reality. Thank you, Amy. Can you just also say a little bit quickly about the work that you do? You, you, I know you mentioned your advocacy sure. across the country, but. Right, so we, um, Strategies for Children, our mission is to make sure that Massachusetts represents, excuse me, invest the investments needed for children birth through five. So we've been focused on um, thinking about policy around young children and um, the funding that's necessary to do that. Thank you, and thanks for all of your work. Um, Khadija, if you, before I ask you the next question, could you just tell us a little bit more about what you do and the role that you you play in both as a provider and in informing um, the city and the state about what makes sense and what doesn't? I am a family child care provider and I serve for a zero to three years. Thank you. I, I guess I would ask you, what are you hearing from your parents? and? Do you see that you're going to get the resources that you need um, in order to successfully reopen? I am hearing from my family because um, that they they wanted they wanted their child to go back to the childcare because they have to work. I have family who has more than one kids, and it's hard having a a two year old and a five months old to work also from home, as you know as a mother and they're all, all the families, of course, everybody wants to go back. And the other thing that for me, I struggle since it, this guideline came is how can I keep one family? Because I can only have so money. They, they limit the numbers of the kids you're gonna have. So how, how are you gonna tell some family I can have you, but I cannot have so-and-so it's, it's a challenge and I did get an emails earlier from one of my families who happened to be a teacher and she said, how are you gonna, how you, how are you gonna do this? And in terms of, um, what was the other question you say, financially you do say? You, do you, so, you know, I know that for family providers and um, the ratio has always been important, right? Because it also, yep. you, it, there's a cost to providing this right. care. And at the same time, there also needs to be your ability to make a living to do this. And right. so now we've reduced the number of kids in your care. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think the state has presented this to you in a way that allows you to financially actually move forward? Not at all, not at all, because they're asking so much that we need to, to reopen it in order for us to go back to work. And how can you, when you limit it, when you ratio, when the number of your kid, the kids you're supposed to take is limited one, one, you need all for us for family child to take all these procedures and you're not supporting. Thank you, Khadija. Uh, Bill, if you could also say a little bit about who you are, and then what I'm going to ask you is well, you know, I think one of the first questions I started out with is who, who are we doing this for? And I, you know, there's this pressure, there's this perception that there's this pressure from the business community, which may or may not be true. I think that there's a lot of truth to that. And, and I don't disagree with it all either, to be very clear. Um, but, but
but who in the business community? Because as a provider, that's also a business. Clearly, people go into this business because they love children. They're never going to make a strong middle class income doing this, right? But are we paying attention to those who are essential in allowing us to open up the economy with these new regulations? Or are we asking them to subsidize the cost of childcare for the rest of the state while then not having the ability to financially take care of their own families? Well, it's a very good point, Representative. Um, and, and yes, I, I represent the Massachusetts Association of Early Education and Care. We're the largest association of providers in the Northeast. Um, our members from North Adams, uh, right down to the Cape, through Boston and Cambridge, um, provide care for children, really four groups of children. They, pay, they, they provide care for children who are privately paying parents, parents pay for care. They provide care for children who are subsidized by the state and the federal government because they're either low-income working families, they're either children transitioning off of welfare, or they're, a seven, in the case of 7,000 of our, our children who are most in need, they are children who are in the custodial care of the Commonwealth Department of Children and Families for Abuse or Neglect. And so our providers across the state provide care for those four subsets of children and you know, the 99% of our programs right now are currently closed with no licenses that have been suspended till June 29th. Um, and we do have some that are providing to, to, you know, the uh, emergency care for essential workers. And it's real easy, you know, it, it's important that you not be confused by that care. That care is not the high quality early education system that so many, including yourself, Representative, have worked to build. And we do have one of the strongest systems of care in this country and here in Massachusetts. But it was an important thing to create. Um, and Amy, Amy's absolutely correct. It has been underutilized. And I think parents, look at even as parents are coming back out and all of us are beginning to engage a bit more into our daily lives. The one area we're gonna be cautious with is our most precious commodity, our youngest children. And so I think people are making choices both in the emergency care. And I suspect as we come back, and we open care because you're right, Representative. There's a lot of pressure right now from businesses, the business community, and even other programs who want to reopen again to be part of doing what they love. There's a real question about who's going to come. Um, you know, some states have who have stayed open. Amy's right. Very few states in this country have actually closed the early education system, and some of those states aren't even seeing a third of parents making use of care for their children. So. You know, it's a real interesting question as we as we as we look at the real difficult choice of what do we look at at ratios right now and how many staff per classroom. The real question is, what is public confidence? Will parents say, "I want to take my two-year-old or three-year-old and bring them back out into the, the world," or are they going to sit there and say, "You know, maybe I'll wait for the take the summer and let's see how it's going in the fall. Let's see if there's a surge. Let's see if there's not a surge." So. It's a real question of what is demand out there and can we meet demand and, you know, with the regulations that have been put there. And that is a really open-ended question that I'm not sure anyone has the answer to. So I guess, you know, I'll ask Leanne, but anyone else should jump in. You know, one of the other questions and concerns that I have, quite honestly, is I'm still wrapping my head around all the regulations that were put out, right? Um, I know that, at least in the House, Speaker DeLeo has appointed two committee members to take a closer look at this, right? So Chairwoman Alice Pice from the Education Committee, mm -hmm. as well as our Chairwoman of um, Emerging Economies um, and Economic Development, um, and Margaret Ferrante. Because the concern has been that we actually don't think that the rollout was ready for prime time. Um, and, that not, and that's not to say that there wasn't a lot of important work to do, but that really there was more to go into this. And where I go is I think about if providers have had to reduce the number of kids that they can provide care to, that means that's less money coming in. Um, you know, um, several of you here have always been great advocates for higher rates in care. I think about the additional cost for what it means to reimagine how to bring joy back into um, care. So Leanne, if that's five additional like sand tables, not tables, trays, like there's gonna be an additional cost that was not put in planned in what is a, 
a thin margin to begin with. And then we're also going to be talking about the um, emotional and behavioral needs that many children and their families are going to bring into care. And the mental health surge is, or it's not even a surge. I think there's a lot of anecdotes out there that show it's happening. So are we providing additional resources and support systemically and methodically um, and proactively for our providers who I think are going to be carrying that, which could also then lead to some stress during the day in terms of care and keeping children safe. I thank you for the question, because I think that there are a couple of things for Khadija to reopen. Um, she has to get a thermo scan. She has to get a face shield. She has to get some equipment. Um, uh, you know, dividers to make her room more separate. She has to figure out how she's going to get people in the door, have the second, there's so much. And that all brings a cost with a reduced number of children. And I can't say enough how worried I am about the sustainability of our provider network, which is really rich in Cambridge, you know. Um, and so I think the, the whether we were ready for a rollout or not, I'm not sure. I know Khadija said she's anxious to reopen. Some of, and who are we opening for? The families who really have to go back to work and have no other provider that's safe and um, you know, so many families are take, having older kids take care of their children while they go back to the supermarket or they become more employed. That's not a sustainable way. And so that's not quality care. And so the question about sustainability, I think is one thing. And then I think about who we're reopening for. I'm not quite sure where I worry and this Please don't take this the wrong way. I'm worrying that we're opening on the backs of our provider community and that the demand, who knows what demand is going to be like Bill said, and the burden is on them in a way to make it work and make it happen with less revenue. I can't tell you, you know, this is... Um, you know the my my biggest worry is will the community will the community sur survive and i talk to directors a lot and some of them are not sure they're going to make it past thanksgiving so leanna the, you know the question that i wrote while you were talking is like whose cost is this to bear and i, I you know i, I don't want to be clear I, I think that we need to move forward if we're opening up if we're opening up the economy right a couple of things are true people need to actually be able to care for their families and have the financial ability to do that. So short of the state providing a universal income to families or paying every provider, every, every employer, the ability to pay their employees while they're not working, right? So we're not doing either one of those. Yeah. We're not granting businesses to keep paying their employers and we're not providing universal income, right? So we have to open that up. But I would have, if, if we had had more um, people at the table, who represent a child care, meaning for me, the advisory table, a rollout would have meant that here is how you're going to create additional joy. Here's how you're going to help deal with the mental health and the trauma of not only coming back, but also what it means to be in a completely different environment that not the one that you left as a child and to deal with the rates of the loss of income that many providers are going to experience. Amy, you have been one of the strongest voices and advocates for, for children and for children's learning and for their joy and, and connecting the dots really well for policymakers, for, uh, for governors. Um, and so if you could tell me more about where where, how are we doing this? Like, what are the resources that are being rolled out to do this? Or are we waiting for providers to remind us what we already know, that they need more and can't do with less? Right. I think um, I think the anxiety that um, Leanne and Khadija have verbalized and Bill is, is where we are. It's, it's, it's at an all-time high right now. And I think people are trying to be like thoughtful, but right now it's it's fear. So I think, you know, we know the state budget process is not, you know, is, is, is different than it has been in other years. We also know that everyone is trying to figure out answers, many industries around funding. 
We know that Massachusetts did receive money, $45 million to the CARES Act, which we have been advocating to uh, release to the field and, and understand the plan. We know that there are proposals at the federal level uh, led by the Massachusetts delegation of you know, refer, you know, Congresswoman Catherine Clark in the House and Senator Elizabeth Warren in the Senate who are talking numbers like 50 billion, 100 billion for childcare. Mm -hmm. We also know the state is probably waiting to see what they will get in general from the federal government. We also know that parents cannot pay more for, uh, for the same service. We also know that um, providers were already making close to poverty wages. We have made progress in the state thanks to the, you know, the leadership of the speaker in the house. Um, but we also know that um, it, it, it's, we shouldn't be fighting every year to make sure that our educators are well paid. So I think we don't know those answers. We have been asking people to put together just sample pre-COVID budgets and then what would it look like now? Because we need to identify that gap. What is the gap that's gonna happen because of you know increased uh, cleaning supplies? And, and you know, someone asked me if staffing would go down. I said, well, no, that the protocols of not parents not being able to go into a class and will probably need a, a staff person to greet the family at the door. So staffing could go up. We've learned from the emergency care programs that um, the stress of, of providing a safe environment in these times is wearing on the educators who are the ones who are dealing with it every day. So many of them are not working full eight to 10 hour days or eight hour days, they're working five hour days. Um, if, if parents are still working from home, Will they need like three hours of care so they can do work? And, you know, I think the unknowns are creating anxiety um, and then never to have been in this situation to think about policy. Um, we also we also know that um, the state budget is going to be, you know, we're going to have cuts across the board. We don't know, not across the board, we don't know where those cuts might be. So I think um, what we're trying to do over the next week is really get good information from programs like Khadijah and Leanne and ask them, what will it look like? Because we need to, we need to be talking about real numbers. We have seen philanthropy step up. We have seen food insecurity be raised as a huge issue. We cannot, those problems are not gonna go away when the economy opens. So, you know, if June 29th is not a magical date, so we need to kind of reframe and that things are going to be different. I, I just wanted to jump in if I could, um, uh, Representative Decker. I think the issue for me also is that there is um, private pay for high quality is not a sustainable business model for families. I mean, some of our preschools in Cambridge, and you know this well, being our rep and being having been on the uh, city council, some preschools cost $40,000 a year, some cost 10,700. But the private pay for a 40,000 means you get really high quality, and that quality in the 10,700 shouldn't be any less. Those children are just as important, but we have no financing across the board. And so this inequity about pay, about degrees, about quality gets skewed even further. So I think what we have to do is take this crisis as an opportunity to think about how do we finance this field when brain development is exploding, when children should have grow their love of learning, and when you want to develop that lifelong curiosity as a learner. You, we can't do it this way much longer. So Leanne, I, I think you and Amy, you know, probably know best, you know, where I have talked often about, you know, if every child born into a community was assumed to be part of the superintendent of that community's responsibility, right? Every superintendent, whether that kid went to the public school eventually or not, if every superintendent understood that every child born was going to be their responsibility um, and started looking at what they were getting early on, we don't allow kindergarten and first grade teachers to have less salary, less resources than we do the fifth grade or the eighth grade or the 11th grade, right? Um, we know that every grade actually invests into the next grade. So this is gonna be an opportunity where um, we, we will have the opportunity to reimagine that, right? Because there's a field of people out there in the business, you know, one of my gripes with the business community, I will say, is that a lot of really amazing people in this business community 
have gone have signed on to many advisory boards and groups supporting and understanding the the, the brain science behind early childhood ed education. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten a lot of lip service, right? What we still don't have is a fundamental transformation. We still think it's okay to pay um, providers and teachers of three-year-olds and four-year-olds, right, three times less than a public school teacher. Um, and that we leave that up to the parent to either figure it out. And ultimately what we all know is that if we don't pay for it at three and four, we're paying for it at six, seven, eight, and nine um, in, in other resources. So um, I, I would say, Khadijah, I, I would ask you, do you, what else in an ideal world, none of this would be happening, right? But given the, the guidelines have been put out there, what else do you think that we should be doing for you recognizing that you're the steward, like you're helping the entire village here, right? Whether we have children in your care or not, we are completely counting on you to reimagine what a nurturing, safe, thriving early childhood experience is. And it's not just your responsibility alone and your resources and your budget and your time to do this. What else would you like to see if we really believe that we're part of the village and you're the steward, what else are we giving you right now? What else do you need? Um, I, <laughs> Leanne can help me with this. I, I think we need a lot as a family child care provider. I don't think so. The state or the city recognize us that we are the seat of this whole early childhood education. Because uh, there's a lot, as you know, there's a lot of family child care providers in the city of Cambridge or around the, the state, and they're not recognized us. And now we're in the same boat as the centers, who happen to be some of them are corporate, and they do they can't afford it. All the PPA, all this again, going back to the guidelines, all this thing that the state want us to, that they want us to expect it to be reopened and going back to the normal, not normal at some level. And I don't know, Leanne can add, I think, can help me with this, I don't know. I think part of what Thank we you. were talking about with Khadija yesterday or the day before was the cost of all this stuff, the PPE, which she didn't have to have, the cost of um, new equipment to not have groups, the cost of, um, substitutes which are hard to find if um and then if she loses if someone gets sick in her program she has to close maybe for 14 days and that's 14 days less of revenue it's hard to charge parents for when you're closed and i think the other thing is an understanding that family child care is so different from centers and khadija was talking about how she makes her center so homey it's a family you know and so how it's not got centers and writing tables it, all of it is part of her curriculum and how are how is she going to do this with so little um, support around the uniqueness of her program and her program style of delivery? The, you know, the if possible should have been a lot more in the guidelines we were talking about. You know, it's 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 not the same thing. Yes, we have to step up the hygiene. Yes, we do, but not on, you know, but we still have to provide quality services. Yeah. Did, no. did I leave anything out that we talked about? No, you did good. Thank you. Thanks, Khadija. Thanks, Leanne. Um, you know, Bill, I'll just go back to this, right? You are representing a lot of providers who I, I will, again, I say are being asked to subsidize, quite frankly, the cost of child care through the lenses of COVID-19. Um, what else, and I, I know we're looking at a budget that, you know, we're, we're gonna have six, seven billion dollars less in revenue. And I think what's hard right now is there's gonna be some areas that we can't cut back on. And, and I say this, you know, without knowing what that looks like, but how do we, how do we, are, are your providers, are, are they worried that really that they're being seen as subsidizing the cost of all this? And, and what are you, what are you advocating for and what do you need? Well, I think Leanne hit an important point when she talked about every child, whether you're in a program that's you know charging 10,000 or 40,000, 
every child in this Commonwealth, whether you have the 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 the, the experience of growing up in a two-parent household, whether you're a child in DCF custodial care, every child is vital to be ensuring that we give them the same high quality early education system. We've been fortunate in the state that we have leaders in the House like Speaker DeLeo and leaders who've been vocal on early education like yourself, Aaron Michaelwitz, Alice Peich, who've gone out there and said, we need to invest in this. Look at the Commonwealth had a decision to make at the end of March. It could easily have said, the system is you know, mostly private sector. I mean, we're not, unlike the K-12 system and the public higher ed system, there is no public early education system. It's a collection of private community-based programs who, you know, many of them take state and federal subsidies, but they're private businesses. And the state could have said, you know what, let the private market figure it out. If they sink, they sink. Yet House leaders, along with the governor, the Senate, the president, got out there and said, you know what, we're going to right now stabilize the public subsidy system. We're going to continue to pay the public subsidy system, even though it's closed. We're going to keep it intact. Um, and that's important. And when we reopen on a much smaller level in, in July, it's important that we keep doing that and moving forward. And we have confidence that the state will continue to do that. You know, we have a $46 million CARES Act, you know, that House leadership is working with Commissioner Triwurgi to make sure that we do operational grants to try and help all those private programs out there who are in such trouble. Uh, and Leanne's not wrong. We could be looking at a much smaller system by November where programs just couldn't survive in this era and went under. Now, obviously, you know, leaders like yourself are doing as much as they can with things like operational grants and by investing in the subsidy system and helping those children who are most in need in our Commonwealth, it makes a difference, but we're in for a challenge. I mean, clearly we're in for a challenge coming up this year and tough decisions to be made. So, you know, what I think about is like the 80s, right? That the mantra from the, the banks where they were, you know, we're too big to fail. And I think about, you know, our, our early education providers and the truth is you're too important to fail. And I do worry about making sure that, you know, what's at stake here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's children. Know, I, I wish I could get everybody who has children and who have who who have grandchildren to and I'm sorry this is um, probably more Amy's bag than mine because of the <laughs> advocacy work but to say to people you know in government in Congress in the Senate um, not only in the, not just Massachusetts but the federal government we are too important to fail you're absolutely right child care is essential and could they please um, support the Child Care is Essential Act, which would get us 50 billion. At least we would have money to keep going, but we still need to look at the structure of financing long term. I just want to oh. add, Rep. Decker, that I, I've only lost it on Zoom three times, and um, but they've all been when I've heard from you know the program that's buying food to give to their families that they don't know how they're gonna um, that they don't know how they're gonna pay for. Um, about the toddler teacher who was trying to do FaceTime with the toddler and the toddler was so excited. You know, we, we are a field of creative, you know, can do, give us a challenge, we'll face it. But we can't lose the fact that we can't do it on the backs of educators that we've been doing historically. Our system was never designed with how do we best do all of these things. It was really about, you know, supporting uh, warehousing children while parents went to work. Mm -hmm. We have asked the dollars that we have to go farther than we ever could imagine. And I, I've, I've seen this across the field. Some people are like, let's go, we can do it. We'll figure it out, give us the resources. Some people are worried they won't be able to stay open. I think one thing we also wanna think about is what's the technical assistance need? Yeah. It's gonna look different. Finances, HR, you know, right now we know that unemployment, if you're on unemployment, you are making more in many industries than you would if you were working in your regular job. And that's not necessarily because we have the best unemployment in the country. It's because what we our realities, our salaries are too low. So we can't lose the focus of that, that kind of math. And I think it is, we do have to let our, our, ourselves think about, you know, what is really at stake here. 
this is not just a budget line item. This is just not, you know, a system that, you know, for better or for worse. Where we we did a parent survey at Strategies for Children, and we found that 94% of the providers were still in touch with the families that they served. We know that families are looking to their providers, you know, for information. And I think, you know, I said earlier about the reopening date, you know, we know providers are getting calls like, can I come on Monday morning? Um, and that, you know, I think we need some clarity. We know that that's not the case. As Bill said, everything, all the licenses have been temporarily suspended till June 29th. But I think not to lose the, the focus of what we're trying to do um, and who we're trying to do it for. So I really appreciate you really thinking about those issues. Yeah, I mean, I think it's for me, it's it's who's at stake, right? We've lost over 90% of our um, mandatory reporters, you know, our providers and our teachers who on a regular basis are the ones who can be some of the first folks to identify whether or not a children is being right. harmed and safe. Um, and, you know, as we continue to work through sort of what that looks like in this distance learning, and there's a committee at the state level um, and the administration that's been looking through that. Um, but I, I think also what's at stake is um, the future of, so, uh, of, of the next generation, the next several generations, right? If children who don't have access to safe, loving, nurturing um, providers and providers don't have the ability to feed their own families while caring for the children before them, um, there's just a lot more at stake here that I, and I think it's easy not to think about it um, unless you are directly in the field or you're paying attention to who's paying attention to our children. Yeah. Um, yes. So, you know, I, I, I encourage people who are watching, if you care about this, um, if I'm not your rep, call your rep, call your Senator, um, support Congresswoman Clark, who's been out there really was a champion from the beginning of her career um, through the legislature and in Congress. Um, but I, I continue to fear that we are rolling out something that we have um, failed to provide additional support and resources to, and that we are expecting this to be done at the moment, um, quite frankly, on the backs of providers and on the hopes and fears of parents. Um, I so, just, go ahead, Leanne. Could, could I add, you know, since um, the last 10 years, we've spent a lot of time since we had QIS talking about workforce qualifications. And I don't know how much money the state has given in scholarship or provided in professional development. But if people don't have a job in childcare, they're going to have to find another field of work, whether it's supermarkets or you know, nannies, whatever, but we're going to lose if we can't stay afloat. We're going to lose people we have worked with for years to up their game, to provide that professional development and all the workforce qualifications that people have gotten, you know, Khadija, for example, you know, that feels like a crying shame too. And cry some of us do <laughs> as a right. and a lot of money that's been invested over the last decade um, by both providers as well as the state um, you know bill i would ask you two things right i um i think about the again going back to that the needs of your providers that they're going to have and the additional needs that children coming into their care are going to have um, i also think about the mental health and the well-being of your providers right, who really are, I can't go through a conversation without this without like getting choked up. And they are going to be right there, you know, caring for children whose lives have been upended and have been traumatized. Even under the best circumstances, children are being traumatized. Um, but a lot of the children that we're talking about are gonna be children who come from already extraordinarily under-resourced families, because that's who has to run back to childcare right now, not everybody, I was talking to a family who are essential workers and they're strong middle class family and, and they're freaking out because they don't have child care that they can feel good about um, because a child, child care provider anywhere is not the same as a child care provider that you know and trust. Um, I also think about Bill and Amy, um, uh, maybe Leanne touched on this, right? But the difference between also the child care providers in the early ed community versus you know, our K through 12 system is, I wonder, I have to imagine that for many of your providers, many of them have stayed 
engaged with children throughout this time and the families. Um, and that's not been true for our public schools. And I'm not to say that our teachers aren't working hard. Our teachers have been working really hard, but what has been completely, a, a, there's been a black hole of meaningful one-on-one -on -one engagement with students and families because the teachers have been overwhelmed and trying to keep what looks like distant learning moving. But that's very different than your providers who I think have had incredible opportunity to keep families engaged. And we can't lose that if we lose providers. Our, our, our providers, you know, look, there's a couple issues there that you touched upon and that are so important. During our closure time, providers have been around the state, have been bringing diapers, have been bringing food deliveries and really trying to help families as best they can. I mean, Look, we have 7,000 children who are DCF, abuse, neglect children in the system. Uh, those children are, are, in some cases, the most stable aspect of their lives of the 10 and a half hours a day they spend in our programs. They're fed two and a half times a day. You know, there's eyes on them. DCF counts are on early ed providers to be a partner in this with them. You know, so a lot of our programs are calling around, checking on children, checking on families, seeing how they can be helpful. But... A second part of this as we head toward reopening is one of the great misnomers out there is that we'll flip a switch and that the early education programs will just open like that. And there's this thought process that our workforce is all 25, 27 year old females. It, in reality, as we all know on this call, our workforce is very diverse, not only diverse on race, they're diverse on age. Many of our, our teachers are, are well over 40, 50 years old, have underlying health concerns themselves. How many of them are coming back at, as they have so-called flip switches? The switches flip? Good question. Um, you know, so programs are gonna have issues just in themselves of reopening. Amy's right. A lot of our early educators who, because they're so poorly paid, are, are making more money on unemployment right now uh, with the CARES Act extension. And if the next, you know, whether it's the HEROES Act that the House has or there's any other variation of that, it somehow extends that with the CARES Act $600 funding, that could be an issue that impacts us dramatically. So we've got a lot in front of us. Um, and we're, you know, but that said, we're looking forward to, you know, in July, trying to reopen this system, trying to be there as a, as a, as a service for children and get our educators like Khadija back doing what they love. Yeah. So I just want to say this and I'll let you respond because we have about eight minutes left. I, I think I want to be clear that I think that the people from the state point of view who've been working on the guidelines are people who care deeply about children, right? Who are thinking very carefully um, about what children need and therefore what providers and parents need. What I don't think has happened and, and I think this is why the speaker appointed a, you know, a special subcommittee on this, is we have not come up with a plan that has more details, because we have still have a lot more questions, and we haven't shown where those resources are coming from to be able to meet the, the answers to those questions. So I think we know a lot of the answers, but for me, I think it is absolutely reckless to think we're gonna open up phase one, phase two, phase three of our state from a, essentially a three month shelter in place and where we haven't actually not only answered all the questions around childcare, and to be clear, it's very complicated, right? This is, this is so complicated because it's not gonna be the same, but we have some answers and to not have done that with a financial strategy. That's for me where you can tell I, I'm just really feeling very biased about, um, and it says to me that that means that we're expecting this to be done at the expense of providers and quite frankly, at the expense of children who will be the guinea pigs in this process. Amy, did you have something to say? Just, I, I would, I would agree that I think that's that that's a that's a point of tension and, and anxiety and fear and real worry. It's not like, you know, we don't know if we're going to have an increase. It's like, are we going to be able to do this or not? So I think over the next week, we want to help collect the questions. The department has said they're going to put up materials to help, like a checklist, all the things we think logistically, but that is not going to answer the finance question. You know, we have been in touch with policymakers across this uh, the last three months, just, you know, sharing the, the real day-to-day -day challenges that people are having. I think forums like this to make sure that we're hearing from people who are facing them are critical. and We should see more of these across the state. I'll just say with the public system, we are also seeing 
districts having to make budget decisions, you know, of their public K to 12 system. And we have, people have been contacting us because places like Brookline, places like Malden, you know, it's all kind of uh, not final yet, but we're hearing about programs that may have to close there. So we, we know that this is a much bigger question. We do know that the, um, communities, like thinking about a community as a unit of change and how we collect data, how we best understand, you know, how we can support children and families is, is and we've seen communities like Cambridge uh, step up to try to think about how we can, how we can at least understand and acknowledge and sort out the problems, but we need additional resources to get it done. Representative, they, they, I just would say uh, you're absolutely correct. There is a, a price tag for this of how do we bring the system back up and, and no one knows what that final figure will be. And it's not just money, but, but money is going to be a driving force. This, But the initial steps, you know, the governor has committed to funding the public subsidy system through December, uh, through, yeah, excuse me, uh, June 29th. Um, and, you know, programs across the state are comforted by knowing that the, the House and Senate have been so supportive of early education. So that is something we'll be looking for as an initial step. The $45 million in, in operational grants that so many private programs are looking for to meet fixed costs, that we, again, that's an initial step that we're confident that the legislature is going to step up and, and, and take the lead on that. So there, there's initial steps, but you're, you're, so, you're so right. There's, there's, there's big decisions that will need to be made as we go through the summer and, and look at the, the deep impact this, this pandemic has had on the state budget of how do we address the so badly needed investment in early education? So, you know, early on, I, I met with somebody who um, is a specialist in crisis and um, disaster uh, relief planning. And what he said was, you know, at some point, um, once you assess everything that's precious to you and your priorities, um, and you start thinking about how to ensure that you don't lose the things that are most important to you, know that the next step is going to be, you're gonna to have to start choosing between things that are equally precious and important to you. Mm. And so when we talk about the budget going down, right? I'm gonna say that the choice that both at the city level and at the state level, at the federal level, are we going to choose children, right? And you know, Khadijah deserves to have that paid for. If we're expecting her to open up her home care, which is probably one of the safest places in, in many ways for children in terms of family connection and engagement, are we providing her or are we providing your center's bill with the dividers, with the PPE? Are we providing them with the tools to understand how to communicate to parents and children in a way that feels supportive? Because even how we talk to each other right now is fundamentally changed because everyone is so fragile. Um, and so I just think that there's a lot here and it's not, it's a lot, but it's not so complex that we don't already know this. And we're talking about a field that has studied this. So the tools are with people in your field. Are we going to pay for them to actually have a, a, a methodical way to ensure everyone has access to those tools? And are we going to remind our policymakers at the city level? Uh, you know, I say this to my colleagues on the city level of Cambridge, every dollar you want to spend, um, every study you want, every every action that you want to impact and increase quality of life, recognize that it's going to come at the expense of something else that's precious. Um, and just to be sure, making sure we're all looking at the same chessboard at the same time, um, or that we have the most precious things on that chessboard. So when we make our choices, we know what we're not choosing. And it's not going to be fun to be the uh, that it's not fun to be anyone in leadership who is going to have to make these choices, whether you're leading a child care center or your home provider or a, a, a state policymaker or city council, right. we're gonna be in positions that we're not gonna feel comfortable about. That is absolutely the truth. So with that, I'm, I'm saying this to you, but I would say, um, Khadija, I'll give you the final word here. Is there anything that you're talking to policymakers here in Cambridge at the state and advocates? Is there anything that you wanna make sure we're hearing from you? We want to help. We want it to. We I want it. We want it as a, I mean, family chuck. I want it for my open my program. I want it to serve my family, my community, and have my job back. And I want it to. I want it help. I want it help because the guideline that they put, they still want us to reopen it. So, thank you. 
I want to say thank you. We have 30 seconds left. We want you to do this job because nobody does it better than those on the ground working with children. Our job is to figure out how to help you do it as safely as possible. I want to thank all of you who are on this. Bill, Leanne, Amy, Khadija, thank you for the work that you do every, every day. Um, it becomes more important now. Special thank you to CCTV who makes these conversations possible every week. Thank you to my staff who are working behind the scenes and to, um, to those of you who've been tuning in every week or just tuned in this week. Um, thank you for your questions and please feel free to tune in next week. And also, if there's an idea that you have for Town Hall, please feel free to email me as well. Um, I wish you all as well as to be as well as you possibly can be in a time that's very difficult to be well, but and be as safe as you possibly can. Thank you. Thank you.